What is up, UCC? If you are brand new, welcome to our church. Today we are starting a brand new series, but before we get there, last week, in case you missed it, man, I'd ask you, go back, watch the YouTube, Tiffany Braden taught, and it was her very first sermon ever. Um, and like I said last week, those weeks are some of my favorite weeks of the entire year, and it's because you're watching Faith in Action. And our passion here at UCC is for you to discover and love who Jesus is. And when you know Him, right, when you're constantly discovering who He is, man, there's an outpouring to do something with it. And last week, Tiffany stepped into something that she has never done before, and I'm just so proud of her, proud that our church is willing to take these risks with us. Um, and man, my heart is just so full. Um, and so if you will, I want to ask you as we dive in, I'm going to start a brand new series of talks today. We're going to experience God. We're going to read his word. But before that, if you could just bow your head, I'm going to ask you to ask God to quiet your soul, prepare your heart for what we're about to hear. And so if you're by your head, pray with me. Jesus, God, thank you so much for what you're doing. Just in our little church, God, from the baptisms, uh, 4th of July weekend, uh, all the way to um, Tiffany stepping out and preaching her very first sermon. God, it's so fun to watch people take those next steps. And so God, today, as we're going to kind of turn the page, God, I'll prepare that everyone here that's listening to my voice would be able to do the same thing, that we'd have the boldness, the audacity to take one next step with you. And then we pray. Amen. Amen. So the other day, uh, it, it is became painfully obvious that being a pastor creates awkward situations. Okay, now hang with me because I guarantee you when you guys go out on, let's say, a dinner date with friends, okay, like you do small talk, right? You talk about kids, uh, maybe you talk about work, uh, you talk about career, right? But the point is, is you start talking about, hey, what are you doing with your life? What do you do for a job? And what are you doing just socially with your family, right? And so it doesn't matter your stage of life, like that's kind of what the conversation is all about. And so we had some friends inside of our neighborhood that they, we met each other uh, um, through a neighborhood walk thing. Um, and so we don't really know each other, but they're like, hey, you know what? We should go out to dinner. Let's grab a couple couples and we'll just go out. And so my wife and I were like, hey, we like meeting new people. This will be great. So we take off for dinner uh, with these guys, and well, what happens at the dinner table is small talk, right? And again, it starts off, hey, who are you guys? You know, we are the Pasics. Do you guys have kids? Yes, we have two kids, eight and ten. Uh, what have you done all summer? Baseball, because we have two kids, eight and ten, that are in baseball, right? And so we're talking about all this stuff, and then there's the inevitable question, hey, so where do you work? Now again, time out. For 99% of all people, that question leads to more conversation that's generally pretty light. Welcome to my life. I work for Unite Community Church. Oh, what do you do there? I am the pastor. Oh, great. Now we're having dinner with a pastor that goes to a church who didn't just go to a church but leads the church. Oh, awkward. Okay, like insert, that was our life, okay? And literally, literally, as if it couldn't get worse, right? Into that became a conversation and a topic that literally became the elephant in the room, right? Because, because you know, you know that at a dinner table there are a couple of topics that you don't talk about, okay? Number one is religion, okay? Number two is politics, and number three is what? Religion and politics, right? I mean, I, the, you do not go there, okay? But the problem is, like I said, come into our little dinner here, okay? What starts is, hey, I am a pastor. So guess what is automatically involved? Religion. Guess where we're at? The dinner table, right? The elephant in the room. Don't talk about religion, right? But then as we're sitting there, this woman finds out I'm a pastor and is like, oh, well, where does your church stand on Roe v. Wade? All of a sudden, I'm like, okay, it just got real. And literally every, like that side of the table was just like, and it was just all eyes on us, right? And it's because there's elephant in the room. And why I bring that up is because we're starting this brand new sermon series called The Elephant in the Room, right? Because, because just like the dinner table has 
topics are like, hey, let's not talk about those. The church has the same thing. And those things are, well, number one, money. Number two, money. Number three, well, you guessed it, is money, right? The thing that we don't want to talk about in the church, the elephant in the room is money, right? We don't like to talk about it. We don't want to talk about it. Heck, your opinion might be the church always talks about it. But the reason we have that feeling is because money really is the elephant in the room. Statistically speaking, money is one of the leading causes for fighting in the home. Money is one of the driving forces that cause divorce and even ratchet it to a whole nother level. Jesus put it this way, is that money is actually the number one competitor for your heart. And because of that, listen to me, for the next couple weeks, we're gonna talk about the elephant in the room. We're gonna talk about money and the reason why. Because for me, for UCC, if you wanna know our disposition about money, what I'm gunning for is to create a church that isn't afraid to talk about money, but we embrace the biblical principles of it so that we can go live generous. Do you hear that? Generous. Like my dream for UCC is to live so far out in generosity that the world can't help but to turn and stare at the goodness of God. Hello. Okay. Like that's my dream. Like my dream, okay, is that we could build a church that outgives the world. And I know I, that sounds crazy. You're like, Pastor B, that will never happen. But you know what? We, we, I think it can happen. I think that's one of the things that we come together will happen inside the church. Because when I want, what do I want for us? Is I want us to build buildings. I want us to build additions onto places. Like there's places that I drive past when I'm going to church, like, like the Penrick to School for the Blind. Like it's a nice building, but could you imagine knocking that thing over and then building a state-of-the-art two-story building? Why? Because we have some great relationship with them? Well, I'd hope so, but two, because why not? Right? I think about like adding on like to schools, like whole wings for special needs students. And you're going, you're going, what you like as you're driving by, you're like, I, we built that. I built that. And people are like, wait, you built what? Like, like, like you, you helped landscape you, you, your church did what? No, like we built it. You know what I mean? Like the biggest, baddest, awesome, most best center for special needs kids. We built that. Like, wouldn't that be the dream, right? That when it's spoken of who is UCC, that they are this live big, wildly generous church who gives and gives. In fact, they give so much. There's no one out giving them. Man, I want that. I want that for our church, but here is the tension. Because I think when we all hear that, believe or not believe doesn't matter, it's like, you know what? The church, that, that would be awesome. Yes, let's do that. Okay, but here's the issue. That if we are ever going to do that corporately, don't miss this, we have to do this individually. Did you hear that? Because that's the tension, Right? Where here's the dirty little secret about the church. You and I, we are the church. You're the church. I'm the church. We're the church. And therefore, generosity of the church only goes as far as we are generous. Okay, and again, again, I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad, but here's what I know about you and me is that listening to this, we're like, yes, 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 I would love to be more generous. But for the most part, we feel like we can't, right? Like, I think we all want to be more generous, but we feel like we can't. And so that's why I want to talk about a couple of things today, and then we're just going to do a little Bible study, okay? Because with soaring gas prices, okay, inflation is just seemingly kind of out of control. Now, interest rates are on the rise. I mean, it's, it's like, wow, like money is becoming a bigger and bigger tension in our families and in our lives. And so let me kind of give us two truths and then we're gonna have a little Bible study after this, okay? When it comes to money, when it comes to generosity, two things are true. Number one, truth one, is that we can't give God anything. Okay, so if you showed up here and you're wanting to hear a message about like, I want you to give to God. Okay, here's, here's the problem with that, all right? Because God already know, owns everything. Again, if you're a follower of Jesus, again, a couple of weeks ago we were in the park Riverside Park, and we were baptizing people in the river. 
I mean, it was awesome. I'm, and what's so cool about it is because what happens is we do church next to the river. We say amen and then walk down to the river and just start dunking people. Like it's, it's, it's like almost like you're in the Bible. You know, it's like this is probably how they did it. Okay. I mean, that is awesome. But don't miss this. Why do we baptize people once they meet Jesus? Right? So once you've decided, I'm going to follow Jesus in my life, we baptize. Why? Because in immersion, okay, what you're saying is that I am fully surrounded, fully. I'm giving my life, my everything. Everything is now God's. Do you understand? That's what salvation is. That's why 1 Corinthians uh, 6, verse 19, it says, You are not your own. You were bought with a price. We belong to God. All we have is is God's. In fact, this whole earth is God's. That's why Psalm 24 verse 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And so when we talk generosity, here's the first thing we have to understand, okay, is it's not saying I'm going to take my money and give it to God for God's purposes. No, no, no. It's God's money and we're going to use it or steward it for God's purposes. And again, when we can understand and and generosity stems from, it's not mine, but his, man, it sets you free. And it also tees up the second truth is that God will take care of us. Okay. Which don't miss this. If you've ever been stuck financially, like you will get this. There's been multiple times in my wife and I's marriage where we're literally stuck financially. And we have to make this choice. Are we going to continue to live generously? Are we going to continue to tithe to the church and to put God first and all that comes with that? Or are we going to hold back to kind of get ourselves back where we need to be physically? Okay, and that's the battlefield, right? And again, even this summer, if I'm honest with you, like our kids are playing travel sports at a pretty high level. Okay, and the cost of that Okay, just be honest, is like, like when I see these, sometimes I'm like, I'm like, yeah, you made the team. How much is it going to cost? Oh, I pee a little. Okay, because, because it's like oh, thousands. I mean, this is crazy. And then I have a choice as a dad. Do I let my kid keep kind of pushing forward and pushing the limits of his skill? Or, or do I hold him back because of money? Like, like I'm telling you, it's, it's crazy, but God takes care of us, right? Where for me, what I've been able to do is I do side work, right? I do siding. Um, and windows on the side. And what's really cool about that is this summer, okay, again, God's taking care of us. This summer, we decided to draw our line in the sand. No, we're going to keep giving. Like, we're not going to compromise our generosity for the sake of these bills we have coming in. And no joke, we decided, well, I'm going to start picking up work. And I've done more and more and more work. And don't worry, I've missed this. I've decided even from that work, I'm going to give. And that's ended so that so much so I've been able to rise in my giving, rise in my generosity. We've been able to give more frivolously to people and needs in the community than we ever have before. And so one of the tensions, right? Come back to the elephant in the room. The reason we don't like to talk about money because we feel like, you know, I would give if I had enough. But the problem is, is that you're missing one of the major truths of God, that God will, he will take care of us. In fact, Jesus put it in Matthew chapter six, and you can go home and read this, but he basically said in verse 25, he's like, basically, don't worry about all that this life is. He's he's commanding us, don't worry about all the stuff. And he's basically saying, that's an order, right? Therefore, you can take it to the bank that God's going to take care of us, which then leaves us with this. Okay, so I say all that, the two truths to lead us to this is that when it comes to generosity, okay, generosity is a choice and the choice is yours to decide how you're going to live. Generosity is a choice. And the reason we know this is because no one ever becomes more generous on accident. Like, have you ever realized that? Like, 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 like nobody ever just decides, you know what? I'm going to just, oops, I accidentally gave to the church. Oops, I actually am giving 10%. Oh, oops, uh, I gave 10%. Now I'm going to raise that limit and stretch myself to 11 and 12. Oops, I gave now 20%. Oops, I'm now going to give to my kids and I'm going to save for my 
kids and I'm going to give to their kids kids so that I can give them an inheritance and pay for their college. Like, you know, that doesn't just happen on accident. Okay. It is a choice that you're choosing to live that way. The problem is, is that most of us never choose to be generous because we believe we can't afford it. We start to say things like, hey, well, 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 when, when I get enough one day, when I get the raise one day, and the problem is that's just not how generous people think. See, again, 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 come into this. We know that generosity is about the heart, right? And it's why when the excuses come, all that you're revealing is that you don't have a heart for generosity. It's not who you are. You're not choosing to be generous because think about this. Like, don't we all know rich people? That like they're, they're, they got money and you cannot squeeze a dime out of them because they are so stingy. Right? Right? I, and I know, I know you all raise your hand. Yes. Oh, I know those people. Okay. But hang on, hang on. Those are rich people. But you also know poor people that they grip into everything they have and they're just downright mean. Have you ever met those people? Right? And so you have rich people you can't squeeze a dime out of. You got poor people that are just hoarding everything and, and like mean because they're so protective. But on the flip side, right? Like you also know rich people that are giving so much. It's like, it's like, I, how do you even have that capacity? That's a lot. Like I've never seen that number in real life and you're giving that. Okay. Like I don't, I don't even know. Right. But then there's also poor people that are extremely generous where they give you literally the shirt off their back and you're like, you don't have a second. And they're like, I don't care. Have it. Right. Right. And what does that prove? Right? It proves that generosity is a choice to be had and all having more does is reveals who you are. Does that make sense? And that's why with all those thoughts in mind, here's the reality is, is I want to give us a why you should choose to be generous. Okay. And so if you have your Bibles, like I said, I want you to understand that there are two truths, two truths, right? And truth number one, it's simply, you can't give God everything. It's all his. And then number two, God will take care of you. Okay, those are like two truths. Now I want us to open up our Bibles and just do a little Bible study in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Okay, where, where Paul, the author of this book, is trying to reach into our hearts. And he's trying to challenge us to grow this heart of generosity. Right? And watch what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So he's starting to say, the more you give, the more you're going to get. The less you give, the less you're going to get, right? He's saying like, this is a heart condition, a choice that you have to choose. And then watch this. Each one of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion for, watch this, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now time out. I want us to lock into this a little bit because, because what is he saying? He's saying that number one, we have to choose. You have to choose. Are you going to be generous? And then number two, he says, this has to be in your heart. This should not be, what does he say? Reluctant or under compulsion. Okay. So what this shouldn't be is that you sit here and listen to a message by me, a preacher, or you watch a video of like, Dying cats, not, don't know why you'd give or feel bad about dying cats. But the point is, is you're like so moved. You're like, oh, that should never be. And you feel so guilty that you give. He's saying, that's not what I'm talking about. He's also not talking about this idea of under compulsion. See a need, meet a need. Right? And I'm not saying that's not good. Like we all need see need, meet needs, right? But what he's talking about is something way deeper. He's saying, hey, hey, let's choose. Let's choose to designate our lives to live generously. And again, why would you ever choose that? Okay, we'll keep reading. Verse 8 says this, And God, who is able to bless you abundantly. Remember, it's all God's. All we have on this earth is God's. He is the steward of it. He, it's all his. He says this, He is able to bless you abundantly. So that in all things and all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Okay, check this out. Verse 10. Now he who supplies seed. So he's just talking, again, he's talking about God gives to us. 
He gives seed to the sower and bread for the food will also supply and, watch this, increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your, say this word with me, righteousness. Okay, I know you're on a screen, so I got to make you say it twice because I know you didn't say it the first time, okay? But he says this, he's going to increase your what? Your righteousness. He's going to enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Now hang tight because why would right generosity be related to righteousness? Okay, is this like penance? Is this like the more I give, the more I'll be forgiven? Okay, is that what he's talking about? No, what he's talking about is that the reason we are to live generous is because it is a faith response to what God's given us. Okay, and understand, you got to get this. If you are ever going to choose to be generous, then you first have to look and everything you have has been given to you by God, and therefore you are a steward to live open-handedly to whatever God wants you to do with that. And you have enough. You have enough. And again, again, I know we push back, right? Because what starts to happen is we start to think of excuses, right? We start to think of reasons why we can't or why we hold back, right? Isn't that the whole thing? When I talk about the vision for UCC, build buildings put on additions, build state-of-the-art facilities for the, 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 the needy of the world, right? Like we would all go, yes, yes, like let's do it. But then I say, then start to give. And here's what we say, I wish I could. And what he's starting to try to teach us that as gas keeps rising, as food prices keep rising, Right? What does it speak about you that you're going to give anyway? What does it speak that as we spend $100 on gas, yet we're going to continue to give to the church? I'm going to keep spending higher on groceries, but I'm going to continue to give. What does that say about us? It shows that Jesus really is real. We do really believe in the truth, number one, that it's all his. And we also believe in truth, number two, God's going to take care of us. Right? Like that's what he is trying to teach us. And maybe it's just me. Maybe. It's just me, but all of us have a margin for generosity, right? But here's the elephant in the room. Okay, okay, okay. Why would we ever choose to do this? Again, keep reading. Keep reading. Verse 11. Was that just doing a little Bible study? He says this. You will be enriched in every way. So if you decide, all right, I'm going to live open-handed. Scripture starts to say you're going to be enriched, okay, in every way so that and don't miss this. Here's why God's going to start to bless you. Here's why God's going to start to give to you. So that you can be generous on every occasion. And then watch this. And through us, okay, us, the church, those of you who say you're believers, those, those who are generous, through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Or in other words, don't miss this, is that when you're generous, here's what it does is it causes you to reflect on your faith. It causes you to look to God. And what has starts to happen is you and I begin to lift our hands in praise to what we have, not what we don't have. Woo, that's good. See, here's the biggest issue in America. Okay, we're going to get into this more next week. But understand, every single day you are marketed to about what you do not have. And here's the message of every commercial and every ad that you'll ever see is that you are not happy unless you have what I have to give you. And that goes for fitness trainers, all the way down to video games, all the way down to food, right? Like as you see that pizza that is so dripping with great cheese and you're going, oh, I've got to have it. And then what happens is you start to look to God and go, God, what about me? Hey God, I deserve this. Hey God, did you forget about me? Look at what they have versus what I don't. And the problem is that is the greatest robber of number one, contentment, but number two, praise and giving to God himself. And if you ask me, the number one thing Satan is doing in our lives is he is trying to blind us from the blessings of God. He's trying to blind us from what God's given us because he knows that if we can reflect and go, wow, God, you know what? I went to bed last night with a full belly. Hey, you know what, God? Gas has skyrocketed, but I still have margin for generosity. Hey, you know what, God? I have a car to actually put this expensive gas in. Like, I am blessed. 
I'm telling you, if we would start there, it starts to shift us. It starts to move us to where, number one, we begin to praise God. But number two, people from the outside looking in, they thank God when you're generous as well. All right, and this is what pumps me up. Watch this, verse 12. This service, generosity, okay, that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions. Don't miss that. Many. Okay, we're going to come back to that. Many. Many expressions of thanks to God because of the service by which you have proved, proved yourselves. Watch this. Others. Others will praise God. Don't miss that. Okay, when you and I live a life that is generous, when you and I choose to trust that this is not my money, but it is God's money. And you know what? God's going to provide for me and God's going to take care of me. What that does is it puts such a praise in our heart for what we have that in such a generous heart that people on the outside start looking in and they start going, man, I might not believe in God. I might not believe like you, but you know what? Thanks for your God for putting your generosity in your heart because of you. I now am blessed. Don't miss that. Isn't that the gospel? Isn't that the message we want the church to be known for? Like, isn't that when we go, I want to build buildings. I want to see our church explode and grow because I want to grow not just our seating capacity, but our giving capacity. Hello. What I want, the reason is because when we go out and do these things, people can't help but to discover and love who Jesus is. Don't miss that. The mission of our church is not to make you feel good. The mission of our church is not to have awesome music. The mission of our church is to help people far from God to discover and love who Jesus is and that can't happen when we're not generous. It just can't. You literally block the glory of God being a conduit to this earth. But, but, but if we choose, oh man, it is amazing what God will do if we just step out and live generously. It reminds me when we were in COVID 2020, like we, we had to make this choice as a church. Are we going to continue to live generously? And you can go on my Facebook you and go to our church's YouTube. We recorded this video of, you know what, we're going to live generously. And so we called a school and one of the local schools told us about a family who her husband had died. Okay. And so now she's a single mom out of nowhere, single mom. And this uh, school started to tell us, man, they're, they're going to be struggling to even make ends meet. And so we decided, you know what, we're going to give her $1,000. We don't know her, but you know what, tragedy, we're going to meet that. We're going to be there for her. And so I got a phone number from the school. And no joke, you can literally look this up on my Facebook. Um, but later, I just call her Cold Stone and I'm like, hey, you know, I don't know what you're doing. I don't even know who you are, but we heard about your incredible loss. And look, our church just wants you to know God still loves you. And I don't know what you believe about God, but here's what I want you to know is that even in your lowest, man, we just want to help you financially take care of your kids and whatever costs you incur. And literally on the other end of the phone, this, this lady just starts to cry. She starts to cry. And what's even more wild is she's like, do you even know where I'm at right now? To which Clearly, the answer is no, of course not. You know, I'm not a weirdo. You know, hey, I got a drone above your head. No, no, I don't, right? But the point is, is that she's like, I'm on the side of the road in Detroit right now. My car is breaking down. Because my husband just passed, I am broke. I have no money. And literally, I had just prayed, dear God, can you cut me a break and please send me something? Because I now have no car and it's broken. And as she finished praying that prayer, here comes Pastor P making a phone call to a stranger to intercede for a prayer on God's behalf. Now, don't miss that. Don't miss that. Do you think that girl inflated her faith a little bit? Do you think that lady, do you think praise God a little bit? Do you think that lady had proof that God really did care and God really did love her? Do you think, do you think? Yes. The answer is yes every single time. And then since then, what's happened is people then come up to me and was like, hey, I saw on your Facebook, I can't believe your church did that. Hey, UCC might be a different kind of church. Maybe I'll give UCC a shot. Maybe I'll make that happen. And don't miss that. That only happens. It only happens is when we're screaming beyond ourselves that, listen to me, we're going to be generous because God was generous to us because we believe these promises. 
We believe, number one, this is God's. It's all God's. And then number two, I'm going to trust that even when I might be freaking out, I know God's going to take care of me so I can take care of you. That's the whole point, right? And I'm telling you, if we do this, God's promise back is that he's going to grow this generosity capacity in us. What that means is one day it won't just be calling a lady to give a thousand dollars, but we can maybe call 10 ladies to give away 10,000. Again, again, just come back to scripture. Again, we're just doing a little Bible study. Isn't that what it says? Again, go back to where we started. It says this, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work, meaning that we are able to just see needs and meet needs, right? This, now... He who supplies seed to the sower and food, bread for food will also supply and increase, increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Do you see that? Do you understand? Like God's just saying, hey, if we choose to step into this, if you choose to do this, listen to me, you're going to be one thankful and start to really see God, man, has been good to us. But two, when we're lived generously, it's then like we're giving the gift of God to the world. And how do we do that? Right? Well, I think there's a couple different ways, but I think the best way that we do that corporately and collectively is through what the Bible calls a tithe. Okay? And again, this is just Old Testament coming in and colliding with New Testament. Because again, and watch the language here on Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, it says this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so there may be food in my house. What he's saying, so there might be plenty so that the church can go out and be open-handed and be a source for people to eat, right? Think about the seed and the bread we just talked about, right? These are holding together and God says, how do we begin to be generous? How do we choose this? He's saying one of the best places to start is in the church and bring the whole tithe, the whole tithe into the house. Now you might go, tithe, what is a tithe? Tithe is literally 10% of all your income. To which I know, I know, in full disclosure, because I felt it too, you're going, wow, hold on, what? How much? And if I could be very, very honest, I remember the first times I had to wrestle with this. As I was thinking, I'm like, hold on, man, I don't, that is a lot of money. I don't have enough. In fact, if I went that direction, there's no way. And I know that you start to say the same thing. Hold on, I, I, you probably heard of the tithe before, but you know what? Maybe you're at less than that, and we start to, we start to well, hold on, I don't think we can. And why is that? Because again, 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 we want to be generous, but we don't feel like we can. And what's so fun about the Bible, and why I said I just want to do a little Bible study with you, is because the Bible begins to then almost argue against our argument. It's almost like God knew that we would push back on the tithe and be like, hold on, that is, that is too much. And so watch this as you keep reading that. He goes, bring the whole tithe so there may be food in my house, right? So that I can go live generously. The church can be the, the hope of the world again and the beacon of light for Jesus. And as we push back and go, but I don't know if I can do all that. God then says, test me in this. Says the Lord, oh yeah, almighty. Because go back to that, I, it's all mine. But he says, test me in this and see if I will not throw open the flood to get to heaven. Pour out so much blessing that there will be not, be not room enough to store. In other words, that it will just be going and moving and going. Do you see the parallels? See, all throughout scripture, it's about getting to give. It's about exploding out into the world about what God's given you. And I know, I know that sounds like, well, hold on, hold on. You're just saying the more I give, the more I'm going to get, and we're all going to get rich. No, that's the prosperity gospel. What I'm saying is the more you're going to give, the more you're going to give, and then you're going to give some more, and give some more, and give some more, because you're choosing to be generous. And like I said, the choice is yours. And what God puts us to is a test. And he's going, hey, man, I want to welcome you to test me in this. And so in closing, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to challenge our church to test God. Now, again, that might be scary, okay? Because, whoa, whoa, whoa! Doesn't Scripture say, put the Lord God not to the test? Yeah, well, yes, except for with our money and generosity. And what does it mean to test God? Like, I, I, I had my uncle explain this to me. It was just perfect illustration. You see, what testing God means is it's, uh, it's essentially like when you test something on earth. Okay, think of this. Like if you had like an old ruckety chair, you know, that's like barely, it's wobbly and barely can stand, you know, 
Like you are not just gonna walk up and be like, I fully trust this, plop, right? Like you're, you're not gonna plop because you're afraid it's gonna split, fall apart, and you're gonna fall on your butt, right? So what do we do? Well, we test it. You know, might put your hand on it, push down a little bit. You might grab it, see how sturdy it is. Very cautiously, you're then gonna lean in and start putting your body weight on it. And then eventually, once you have tested that material, that chair to be sturdy enough, eventually you will plop. Eventually you'll plop harder. Maybe you might even friend a, invite a friend to sit on your lap. You know what I mean? Because you know, you know, this might look rickety, but I know, I know it's going to hold me. Listen to me. What God says to do is do the same thing with your money. He says do the same thing. Scripture says, test me in this. And so if you're at one of our physical locations, here's what we've given every single person at the door. Just a little notepad. And what I want you to do is I want you to choose generosity today. What I want you to do is choose and write down, or right, what way, how am I going to test God in this? Because God's saying that if we, if we start to give to the house, he's going to blow it open and we're going to be able to do more, more than we ever could do apart. Okay? And so what that means, maybe you've never given to a church before. Maybe you've never given to anyone before. Here's what I would say. Scripture says you want to work towards the tenth, tenth, a tenth, a ten percent. You might go, that, that just is crazy to me. Well, he says, test me. Here's what he'd say. He'd say, take this thing out, flip open the pad, take out your little pen. Isn't that cool? Sorry, I just wanted to do that because I think these were so cool when we ordered them. Um, maybe you just write down 1%. Matt, you're just going to dip. I, I'm just going to give 1%. 1%. Again, again, I know it might be small, but you know, I want, I want you to test God. Say, is this, is this really good? Is, is then the, the blessing going to blow open? Right? Maybe you're at 5%. And then, you know, I want, I want you to stretch. Why don't you get to 6 Maybe you're at 10% and you're like, you're there. And here's maybe for you, okay, like you've heard us talk about the things our church want to do. Okay, if you were at our vision night, you guys know we got about $10,000 we need allocated to our Celine church. We need another $25,000 towards Down River Church. And listen to me, for you, if you want to give online, we put a whole separate section of capital gains campaign. And maybe for you, generosity looks, you're going to go above 10%. I mean, for you, you didn't write down, right? But I want you to test God. God says, hey, test me in this. And let's just see what happens. Okay? And here's what I want you to do. Okay, the next couple weeks. Okay, and we're going to kind of keep talking about this. Okay, next week we're going to talk about how debt is dangerous. We're going to talk about how to get out of debt. It's really, really practical stuff. The week after that, we're going to talk about legacy living and how to choose generosity so much so that you actually get to leave a legacy behind your kids and grandkids and those kids' kids, like leave a legacy. Be really excited about that stuff. But for today, you just got to choose. What does generosity look like to you? Okay? You've got to choose at some point. I'm going to be generous. I'm going to do the things God has called me to do. And again, as you do that, and I want you to write down three questions that as you kind of record how you're being generous, okay? Because again, Start with the church. Secondly, maybe you see a homeless person. You start, hey, I'm going to do something crazy for you. Maybe um, it, it's, it's a, a random radical need in the community. Like, I don't, I don't know what it is for you. But we start with the church, and then we go out. But I want you to start to record how you're generous. Maybe your 1% becomes 2, 10% becomes 12. Uh, you know, give away a car. I don't, I don't know, but, but write it down. And then I want you to ask three questions. Three questions. And we're going to come back next week, like I said. And these are the questions you want to ask yourself, okay? Is number one, did you miss it? I'm not saying giving won't hurt, but do you miss it? Number two, is you regret it? Because my belief is I don't think anyone ever regrets buying a meal for someone. Because then the third question is, is was I blessed by it? And I'm telling you, when you can... Look and track your generosity. Then ask those three questions. Here's what I know. According to scripture, God says, test me. Test me in this. And let's just see if he doesn't blow open the floodgates of heaven for what our church's capacity to give can do, what your capacity is in our community. And I'm telling you, those colliding starts to say that you're going to start giving thanks to God and the people all across the world looking in, that even though they might not believe like us, are going to praise God for us. And listen to me, that's what I want.
the DNA of our church, when people talk about UCC, it's, man, that's a generous church. That's my prayer. So if you're better heads, and close your eyes. Here's where I want to end. I want to end by reflecting on Jesus. Right? Like we give because he first gave his life for us. And remember, we said that there are two truths. Two truths. Number one is that we are his. And all we are are his. And I think we always need to start from that. That Jesus, you died. You gave your life for ours. And now we are now yours. And so, God, I want us to come back to that. And the second truth is, God, you're going to take care of us. And, oh, God, as we've talked about, hey, what are you going to commit? What are you going to do? That can be scary for a lot of people. The elephant in the room is money is a hard topic. It's why we don't like talk about it at church. But, God, your scripture is so abundantly clear that you've given us this ministry. And here's my prayer for our church is that we would, we would choose to be generous. And so God, in these next few moments, God, move in our hearts, move in our people. God, let us be generous, wildly generous, so that then you can open the floodgates so that we could give even more. Jesus, we love you. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Man, I love, love, love you guys. Thank you so much for attending UCC. Hey, if you need anything, just email us at info at unitecommunitychurch.com. Me or another pastor will connect with you. Or you can always download our app. Anywhere you download apps, just download Unite Community Church. You connect with me, another pastor, see our events, all the different fun things we're doing. Man, I'm telling you, we are going to become wildly generous, especially in the fall when we have our big give, but you don't want to miss a thing. Download our app. I love you guys. We'll see you next week.